Podcast. Welcome back to another edition of the Crisscross Corner Podcast. We are officially in season two. All right, episode one hundred and one. Um, we're back, starting a new season. Of course, I like to start off new seasons by myself to educate people about Detroit and how it became what it is today. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to talk about one of the more famous mayors of Detroit, uh, not Kwame Kilpatrick. Uh, We're going to talk about Albert Eugene Cobo. Albert Eugene Cobo and his impact on the city of Detroit. This is episode two of my Detroit Impact series. And before we start this whole uh, rundown on who Albert Cobo is and what he did for Detroit and his impact on Detroit, I'd like to shout out all the people in the Facebook group, all the people in the Crisscross Corner Facebook group, all 731 of you guys. Thank you for supporting the podcast. If you want to support monetarily, you can support on Anchor, Anchor dot fm slash crisscross corner slash support you can support with a dollar five dollars or ten dollars whatever you choose thank you for your support all right let's start off by saying that detroit has been led by a lot of mayors who were very corrupt albert cobo you could say he was corrupt um while you won't find anyone calling him corrupt, uh, Albert Cobo and his policies helped to set the stage for Detroit's decline in the 50s and the racial strife that plagued the city to this day. 2022, guys, and we're still one of the most race, racial divided cities in America. I believe we're, I believe Detroit is about 85% Black and the other 15 are a mix of different cultures and races but it didn't always used to be like this uh before pre-1930s pre-1940s the city was majorly major majorly i can't speak today uh it was majority white with a mix of you know blacks natives and you know the other races Somewhere between 1920 and 1950, there was a huge influx of African Americans and Eastern Europeans to Detroit for work. And back in the day, it was very racist. So certain Blacks got jobs, and then certain Whites got jobs. Also, back in the day, you had programs and laws that said that Black people couldn't live here. Jews couldn't live here. Romanians and Ukrainians can't live here. The Irish can live here. That's why we have Corktown. Pole Town. Polish can only, only live here. Jews can only live here. Blacks could only live here. So in the 1940s, 1943 to be exact, there was a riot. The 40s riots were more so white people um, rioting and terrorizing black neighborhoods at the time. Because at the time, the 40s, black pe- more black people were moving into Northern cities like Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee, Cleveland, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, etc. Those were riots against black people, and they would kill and ravage black communities. That was in 1943. Albert Cobo saw this, and he said that he doesn't want he doesn't want racial, I guess, racial you know tensions. In his mind, he didn't want racial tensions. And let's just start off by saying that Albert Cobo was a Republican. That's just a huge preface of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, Albert Cobo, uh, during the Great Depression, uh, which was in the late 20s, late, early 30s, uh, he was an accountant. And he saw, I mean, he was a city treasurer. He saw a lot of things for a city which led to him being able to become a mayor of a city like as big as detroit because back in back in the day detroit was literally if not the third the fourth largest city in the u.s so 
It's crazy to think about right now, but he was. So, in a, in a you know, to summarize, Detroit Mayor Albert Eugene Cobo, um, he became the mayor of Detroit. His um, policies and his way of life kind of like made Detroit almost explode in civil war back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So Kobo ran the city of Detroit at the city's peak population, as I said. Uh, it was almost 2 million people back in 1950. It would be all downhill for the Motor City from then. While the writing was on the wall, Kobo was unable to do anything to stop it. Uh, in fact, he, he wound up uh, encouraging the explosion with all of his policies. Now, what are these policies? You keep on saying policies and stuff, you know, what, what, did, he, what did he do? Well, well, glad you asked. Um, Back in the day when all the Blacks and the Eastern Europeans and people started moving to Detroit, a lot of housing projects were proposed to be built around the city of Detroit. This man, Albert Cobo, when he became mayor, he was like, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to centralize poverty. We're not going to centralize all these people who don't have enough income in certain spots. We're just going to keep, I think he kept three or four of them. And this kind of spread um, poverty around the city, of course. And also back in the day, they had strict laws, redlining, and stuff that certain people, Blacks and Jews, couldn't get houses anywhere. So they were stuck in these enclaves on, in the city of Detroit which are still present today, all right? Still present today. Um, let's talk about urban renewal because that's pretty much the big urban planning topic for Albert Cobo and his impact on Detroit. Um, his expansion of the expressway system took place during his time, which kind of, you know, raised black neighborhoods, um, police targeting black communities and all that stuff happened during his time. So supporting cities, housing, segregation policy. And the effects of these policies and things that happen are still present today in one way or another. Most of these policies will play a part in leading to the uprising of 1967. Okay. Um, Kobo died on September 12th, 1957, a few months before his last term was over. He died in his office, irony. Um, they made the convention center downtown, Kobo Center, named after him, after his passing. However, a lot of people don't know what really happened during his, uh, his reign as mayor. So on August 27th, 2019, the center was renamed TCF Center, which it's now renamed to the Huntington Place, I believe, because Huntington and TCF kind of merged. So now it's called the Huntington Place, which is uh, Detroit's huge convention center downtown. So yeah, a lot of things happened. Let's go back to things that happened. Well, the Spirit of Detroit statue was built when he was mayor. Um, the Komene Young Municipal Center was built right there. Um, like I said earlier, the expansion of the expressway system and the, basically it was a, what's it called? The Berlin Conference of 1881. Basically that's what he did in Detroit. He was like, they can live here, they can't live here. They can live here, they can't live here. Which pretty much, laid out the fabric of how Detroit's neighborhoods are built now. If you look on an aerial map, you can see where the line was for most of these redlining practices, where whites could live, where blacks could live, where wealthy blacks could live, where poor blacks could live, where wealthy whites could live, where poor whites could live. Corktown is a huge example. Corktown, uh, Pole Town, you have Fawcett Edison, you have uh, Schoolcraft's neighborhoods, you have Brightmore. All of those neighborhoods were planned based on race. Eight Mile Road, the famous Eight Mile Road, is a barrier, arbitrary barrier 
for black and white in the city of Detroit. It's not rocket science to think that maybe systematic racism, systemic racism is still alive in America. Because back in the 60s, 50s, 40s, 70s, 80s, it was prevalent. Okay. So Albert Cobo, mayor of Detroit from 1950 to 1957. Mayor when the city's population was at its peak, 1.8 million. Okay. Cobo was trying to reinvent an aging city. Okay. The Motor City, it was called. I mean, I don't think it's still called the Motor City, but you can be, you know, nostalgic if you want to. But um, Cobo stoked racial tensions. Keep in mind that the city did not have a fully healed, they haven't fully healed from the 1943 race riot. So whites were like, this is our city. Blacks were like, this is our city. Because and in the 60s, it was pretty much almost half and half, maybe 60, 40 white in the 60s. Um, however, they had those huge black areas, black enclaves of black excellence that the whites were like, oh, they're taking over. We got to stop them. And then the 1967 riots happened. We can do an episode on the riots, both riots, actually. We can have a story about that with uh, historians from Detroit and urban planners from Detroit later in the second season. But it was crazy that people put in power by the people of the city were trying to keep the separation of black and white. It's crazy. So he did stoke white people's fears of increasingly restive blah, black Detroiters, hinting that he was the only thing keeping them at bay. So that's crazy. That's a quote. Housing, housing discrimination was rampant in Detroit, as I said earlier. And many of Cobo's policies had a negative effect on housing opportunities for African Americans. He vigorously opposed Black public housing because he opposed subsidies for poor people in favor of more private ownership of property. But back in the day, private ownership of property was, you know, was we were we were kept out of that. Black people were kept out of private ownership of homes in more desirable neighborhoods. We were kept in the more dilapidated neighborhoods that weren't even helped, weren't even looked at once white people left. So our, and our neighborhoods kept on deteriorate, deteriorating while white people's neighborhoods were flourishing, getting more funding, more sidewalks, better streetlights, better electrical infrastructure, running water that was clean. Meanwhile, black people, brown people, Asians, Jews, they had to sit and look at all this, wow, they're moving to the suburbs. We're stuck in this city. That's what happened when Cobo was mayor. So housing discrimination was just ridiculous. And it wasn't just in Detroit. It was all across the nation. So, I mean, I understand what Cobo was trying to do, but he didn't have to do it in the way he did. So Cobo planned to demolish the slums, quote unquote, um, which were home to mostly immigrants and black people. So, as we know, Black Bottom was uh, raised up uh, for 375, which is now is, is going to become a boulevard in the next few years, which is ironic. Um, he heavily pushed for the expansion of the expressway system. Many of his backers were white, wealthy suburbanites who wanted a faster, easier commute into the city. Um, Kobo's quest for more and more freeways directly fueled the city's decline, which means you know, more people left the city because there were more freeways and more cars were being accessible to more affluent, more middle-class people, which they all left and moved to the suburbs. Many of these suburbs you know, came to pass. Uh, Ferndale became one of them. Southfield became one of them. Redford, Livonia, East Point to the east. Mount Clemens became huge. Uh, Warren, Hazel Park, Lincoln Park, 
Allen Park, Dearborn, they all became huge because of freeways. And a lot of middle class people left, leaving immigrants and black people to fend for themselves. Um, instead of making the city more accessible, accessible and bringing folks in, it caused the city to bleed out both population and businesses. And so this, I like to talk about this because people don't understand. When people left the city, all the wealth left with the city. A city that is supposed to be built to support, at the time, in 1950, and it was still a lot of space left, it had 2 million residents. Think about that. A city, you have a room full of 10, 2 million residents. 2 million. You build a freeway, and two-thirds of those people leave. You're used to getting a dollar from 2 million people. That's $2 million. Now you only have 500000 and your bill is still $2 million. What are you going to do? You're going to tax them higher. So taxes went up. Water bills went up. Electric bills went up. So, And most of the people who stayed can't afford to give you a dollar. So now you're, the city is more in debt. The people are poor. The city's in debt. And that, from 1967 on, the Detroit City Council and everybody was racking up more debt and more debt and more debt. And that's how the bankruptcy of 2013 happened. We couldn't take it anymore. Okay? Also, when the people and the wealth leave the city of Detroit, people want to see their sports teams. That's why the Lions left in 1975. That's why the Tigers had to go to Tiger Stadium. Actually, the Tigers stayed in, stayed in Detroit. I'm going to redact that. The Tigers stayed in Detroit. However, the Lions and the Pistons left. The Pistons played downtown in downtown Detroit at Cobo Hall. They moved to Auburn Hills because that's where all the people were. Now, fast forward to 2016, 2017, when everybody moves back to the city. More wealth comes back to the city. And it kind of it kind of has to do with having a white mayor. The white people feel safe in Detroit again. The state took over Belle Isle, because Belle Isle was the Wild West. I'm not I'm not gonna lie. It was the Wild West. So now it's not the Wild West anymore. It's a state park that many people can bring their families back and have a good time in the city. A lot of a lot of uh, uh, residents don't like that. However, that's what we got to do to bring the city back to what, what it once was, a great city. However, we want it to be a great city without the racial tensions. We want it to be a powerhouse. The city, like, yeah, that's Detroit. That's a great city to live in. However, looking back on all the stuff that Kobo did, it's hard to say we want to go back to a, a city that once was, but we can do it without, like I said, without the racial, the racial tensions. Okay? So we can look back on Albert Kobo, and you kind of want to, you know, people say, why did they change it to Kobo, from Kobo Arena to TCF? Yeah, this is why. He was, he was very racist. Very racist. He didn't care about black people. He didn't care about immigrants. And he didn't care about the city's direction moving forward. He just cared about the then and now. And that's not good if you're a, an elected official. You got to think about there and now and the future, the sustainable future. Without a sustainable future, you're doomed to lose. And that's what happened in 1967 and in 2013. And in 1943, 1943, 1967 were two similar yet so different points in history to look back on when you're looking at racial tensions. 2013 is what we can look back on to see that economically, your city needs to be sustainable. If you look around Detroit right now, 2022, there are still neighborhoods from 1967 that haven't been cleared up. 
there's still neighborhoods from the early 90s, the early 80s that got burnt up on Halloween that haven't been cleared up. Yes, you can go downtown and look at all the big buildings, the, the river walk, you know, the nice restaurants, the queue line, Little Caesars Arena, Fort Field, Fox Theater, all those great sites, Midtown, Corktown, Eastern Market. Once you go out, get out those neighborhoods, you'll see the impact of 1943, 1967, and 2013. So I'm going to leave you with this message. Which one of those instances, because I only named three, there's plenty more instances that could happen. Would you rather have 1943 happen again? 1967 happen again? Or 2013 happen again? Or none of the above? And if you pick none of the above, what things would you do to ensure that those three things never happen again? Because right now we have a white mayor pushing a white agenda that the residents don't like and the suburbanites love. So I'm gonna leave you with that on this episode of the Criss Cross Corner. Welcome to the second season. I'll be back with the great debaters throughout this season as special guests, and we'll have more guests talking about Detroit urban planning and more in Detroit. Music, movies, cartoons, nostalgia, all you want here on the podcast. Support the podcast, anchor.fm slash crisscrosscorner slash support. Go to shopcrisscross.com for podcast merch, all the podcast merch, Detroit merch, and decor for your home. I have new pillows, live, love, laugh, uh, relax, unwind pillows in colors that you will, that you might love. Uh, I have a few, and I'm about to put them on my new King mattress, which I'm going to get next week to make my room look good, but you can have some too, $25 for a pillow. If you want free shipping, type in the promo code Chris, K-R-I-S. Again, promo code K-R-I-S for free shipping. And that has been another episode of Chris Cross Corner. Welcome to season two. Uh, if you wanna go back and look at my episode one of the Detroit Impact series, we have Fred Law Olmsted. Uh, who designed most of the city's uh, landscaping and Belle Isle. So please look, uh, go back and look at that episode or listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, YouTube TV. Also, I'm on Twitch. I'll be playing FIFA starting in January. So please go to Twitch slash Crisscross Corner, and I will, will be playing FIFA. All right. Stay safe, y'all social distance, and be nice to each other.